the Greeks had a creature in which they believed created typhoons. The Hakatonkarius, 50-headed, 100-handed creatures hell-bent on annihilation wielding the power of storm. So much so that Zeus enlisted them to help fight the Titans. The gods may be mythical, but the earthly phenomenon of typhoons is very real. In a time where the words lockdown are on everyday lips, familiar gathering places look like disaster zones. The flow of time is meaningless to us as we all dream of better days both past and ahead. I sought to tell the tale of an island and its experience with typhoons. I gave it my all and this is how. Yeah, your son had a plan and everything. However, it just wasn't meant to work out in the end. The good news is, I've never been the type of person to let failure get me down. Yep, I'm the one who believes in those Michael Jordan failure platitudes. And those Einstein posters where I didn't fail, I just found a thousand ways it didn't work. Because, well, after time and practice, I believe you can succeed in whatever you're trying to do. Just like the bus shot, I made several things to try and tie it all together. How about a milk tea story? Hell yeah, love that stuff. Nope, didn't work. Ooh, how about a Final Fantasy VII opening where everything's dark? We all look up at the sky for waiting for Meteor to bring about the apocalypse. Nada. Fuck. I should just delete everything and move on to the next. But yet, inspiration came from an odd place. See, the missus asked me to build an extension to our shelf next to our couch. And I have an ever-growing collection of wood scraps wanting purpose. The plan was to document Taipei before, during, and after the storm's arrival and departure. However, life here would not stop moving and I'll be damned if I'm gonna let all my footage go to waste. Cause shit, Taipei on a rainy night sure is photogenic. Typhoon's Infa and Chanthu would ultimately never arrive on the island, giving me the literal, yeah, you got it. These wood scraps that would teach me you can still make something from chaos. Let's take apart some typhoons and see how they work. Welcome in the house of fun. We'll need an ocean. And how about an upgrade to the wooden ocean to at least the right color, ish. I don't like plain M&Ms. The peanut ones are my jam, but here we'll give the plain ones a purpose. There is a slight possibility these maps are from when my wife was in elementary school, as the store I got them at is that old. We'll give them some new life, then death. So we build our earth where, surprise surprise, typhoons take place. And hey, Greenland apparently is the master of time since it has all the clocks. Russia, Africa, everyone else coming to the party. Australia's just hanging out down there, mate. Then there's Taiwan. Whoa, Jesus, get that out of here. This heart is for all the island nations, especially the Philippines, cause uh, I ain't cutting out all those dots. So Japan, Malaysia, all the other island nations. Love ya. Okay, damn, that is a pretty sweet earth, you might say. Round. All tropical storms are the same. They only change names to denote where they occur. If it's in the Atlantic, we know them as hurricanes. West Pacific, Japan, Taiwan region, they are typhoons. Indian Ocean, East African coasts have cyclones. Hey, the more you know. Like a table, there are parts essential to create a typhoon. And this first step is essential to the formation and the life of a typhoon. Moisture, a lot of it comes from the sun heating the ocean and allowing warm moist air to rise up, condense, and form the clouds we see in the sky. This process continues adding more and more moisture. The constant flow of warm air rising allows the clouds to stay aloft. That is, until the water becomes heavy enough to overcome this and we get rain, and lots of it, especially when related to typhoons. 
Aside from the wind, it's the next biggest source of destruction from floods. You really can't separate typhoons from rain. The next part is probably the most famous part of a typhoon, and that is its winds. And trust me, what you're seeing isn't as bad as it looks. I've lived through a few hurricanes and seen the winds, and uh, trust me, this ain't it. Speaking of wind, we've only just begun. Creation of the storm's winds are from a runaway process that is mm, unique to tropical storms. Okay, so we got our clouds and warm air rising. As the air rises, it starts to cool off. And like George McFly, its density changes. And thus it cools more and sinks back to the surface, all to be reheated and start the cycle again, creating endless wind and movement. It really just does not stop. The next piece is really cool. The heart of the whole typhoon and uh, weather in general, that is the low pressure. So right now we're looking at it on a molecular level, but it will apply to the bigger picture. I just need to demonstrate. Think of low pressure like a space or a void where there once was a molecule, but it moved. This space is really important as it represents imbalance. And since the universe likes to exist in balance, other molecules move in to fill the void, restoring balance. Say cheap Star Wars reference. Uh, was I supposed to say that? I know what you're thinking. The next molecule just moves in to fill the void. See, but actually the void is not filled from the molecule in the back, but from the side, from the other molecule you didn't even know was there. Clever girl. Whoa, wait, advice animal image? Careful with that joke, it's a dinosaur. Jesus, the levels of meta on this joke. Hey, maybe they should start a company and then threaten to shut down cause it's stupid. Fuck, I'm done, leave it. Low pressure on a large scale is just the eye of the typhoon with air and the universe rushing in to fill the void. But it's huge and makes this violent typhoon possible. And if you happen to be a merc and blown up, don't care. that's a category five storm. So how did typhoons get this big? Well, they don't exist in a vacuum. They are a vacuum. Now literally. As the cycle rages on, it influences the air around it to join and just grows at a pace at what could be seen as infinite. You don't even need the sun at this point, it's self-sustaining. Many institutions note that a typhoon is the perfect engine. Bears. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the very distinct visual aspect of a typhoon, that being that they spin. And there's a pretty cool reason for this. It's called the Coriolis effect. Let me explain. No, there's too much. Let me sum up. Get yourself a globe and give it an equator. Next, everything is in reference to the poles. Here, then just pick a spot, call it A. Both spots spin in sync, but in relation to the poles, the spot at the equator must travel a further distance than spot A. So it's traveling at a greater speed. Since typhoons are so freaking big, this effect causes them to spin. Here's another way to visualize this. It's like the storm is two different racing games with the bottom being F-Zero and the top being Mario Kart. Excellent games with one using a significantly higher amount of speed over the other. The titles tell you which one. It's F-Zero by the way. Side note, this is my first time ever to learn about this effect. It just, it was one of those facts of life I never questioned. It just, in first grade, Mr. Nelmark's like, hey, water's wet, typhoon spin. Oh, huh, okay boss, got it. Even puppies understand. As we wrap up our journey, ultimately, neither typhoon would come. And life here just kind of went on like normal. Like, yeah, it rained hard for like 20 minutes. I just shot it in slow-mo because it's super sweet awesome. But the wind never picked up more than a windy summer day. And at night, it was non-existent. All in all, it was just a wet couple of days. This episode, like the table, may be far from perfect, but it's just right for what we need. The lesson is even with scraps, you can make something. So we'll try again next season. Thanks for coming. Later, taters. Another round.